What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I'd like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. And another, I'm blessed to host another epic event today. And today we have a special guest and our special guest. And by the way, let me go back. This is being uh, a collaboration between UNDPAD Push Coalition and the Black Business and Professional Association. So they are making this happen. I'm just a vessel here today. Now let's get to it. We have a very special guest here today. But before we introduce him, going to have Richard Sharp give a little update on UNDPAD and some of its working. So Richard, as always, a pleasure to work with you. How are we doing? And it's, the screen is yours. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Vibe. And uh, thank you, Matthew, for taking the time to join us. I'm just going to do a quick little context setting uh, as part of some of the work that we do with UN Push. Uh, Dr. Vibe, I think I'm going to have to ask you to let people in when they're uh, in the waiting room because I'm going to uh, be distracted with my uh, long-winded explanation of what we've been up to. I'm going to share the screen. Uh, I'm going to share the screen now uh, so that I can give everybody just a quick, quick overview of what we've been up to uh, as UN push to get us to a place to start talking about the UN decade, the people of African descent and the, and the work that we have been undertaking uh, thus far. So uh, everybody knows that the UN decade uh, uh, started in 2015, going to 2025. The government of Canada uh, adopted that decade uh, in uh, January of uh, 2018 uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an event at uh, Parliament Hill. Um, we, we then participated as Push Coalition, a number of Black organizations to uh, secure some money for Black Canadians through um, uh, capacity assist for uh, Black nonprofit organizations, uh, and also uh, monies for uh, anti-racism uh, and a, a number of other initiatives to, to support Blacks during this time. Um, Dr. Vibe Show since has been engaged with us to, to, to broadcast our work and, and, and have a number of conversations with parliamentarians and other folks within the community across the country uh, to help amplify this work uh, since last year. We engaged with uh, CAFCAN, the Caribbean African Canadian Association through a meeting of the minds to continue having some of these discussions about how the money could be uh, spread, uh, spent and, and utilized uh, through black communities, uh, through the leadership of uh, Floydian Charles Friedel and, and Sylvia Paris, uh, from uh, the Del Mar Buddy Day Learning Institute, we were able to uh, engage uh, the department responsible Employment and Social Development Canada to uh, start having these conversations of the design of the, uh, the capacity assist 25 million uh, fund. Out of that work, out of CAFCAN, uh, the UN Decades of People of African Descent was born uh, it was really uh, a grassroots uh, effort. The UN PUSH is a flat organization that has uh, no structure, but a singular focus in trying to help us get the money to black people that, that has been committed to us. Uh, and we have been working uh, with uh, government departments, uh, agencies, uh, and uh, politicians uh, ever since uh, uh, summer of last year around this time. Uh, some of those conversations translated into uh, organizing and working with others, including the folks at Meeting of the Minds, uh, some other organizations, the uh, Federation of Black Canadians, uh, a whole bunch of organizations to come together in, uh, in, in Gatineau across the river here in Ottawa uh, on July 23rd to, to basically ratify, come to an agreement with uh, of, of 30, 36 organizations, 33 of those organizations, basically ratifying a way forward to support the capacity assist. This was the first time that the Department of Employment and Social Development had engaged black communities in this way. Uh, and it was a very fruitful engagement that got us to a place where we were moving from um, um, not have any black presence uh, in terms of programming within the department to having something that was co-designed by us uh, and the department, uh, us being community. 
uh, out of that work uh, solidified the uh, Canadian uh, the um, the Canadian Institute for People of African Descent that CAFCAN is leading. That was their initiative. Um, we helped just to help push that along through the bureaucracy. Um, it was their leadership that really got this thing started, and uh, we are very thankful that we are now moving towards uh, standing up an institute that that uh, connects uh, Black communities. Uh, and uh, and other uh, organizations, uh, academics, business. Um, once that is up, it'll it'll be very fruitful for for our work moving forward. Um, since that time, and this this was about uh, you know when all this great work um, culminated last summer. Um, prior to the elections, we uh, really did engage the department to try to make sure that we. Um, um, Approved, we got everything approved, got money set aside for that 25 million in particular. Uh, we were also working with Canadian Heritage around anti racism uh, to, to try to make sure there's an anti black racism focus with that work. Um, after the election, things have kind of slowed down. Um, there's, uh, there's, I think we all recognize that we were hoping to have that 25 million at least as a start in terms of engagement with the government uh, and us to, to start engaging our own communities that tend not to be able to access those, access those funds. Um, COVID-19, uh, as of February of this year, has just amplified that need. Um, the fact that we don't have Black intermediaries now on the ground is, is, an, is an, uh, an area of concern. Uh, Push Coalition has been working with other organizations to, to support the large intermediaries, United Way, the Red Cross, and the Community Foundation, uh, to uh, be able to access and find our organization so that we can get those some of the funds, emergency funds, uh, to that is desperately needed by our communities um, in in real time. So um, that's basically where we are at. Um, still, sort of uh, struggling and uh, pushing to get uh, our fair share of, of of things as a distinct group in this country. Um, I think it should be noted that uh, at this particular point in time in history, with the George Floyd killing and the amplification of police brutality against Blacks in North America, in Ottawa, in Montreal, in Toronto, uh, Halifax, that uh, this is actually an opportune time where people are, uh, our people have always known, but now white people are a little bit more woke to the reality of, uh, of anti-Black racism and how white supremacy works in this country. And I think there's a, there's a desire and a need for people to want to see some action and some progress. Um, happy to have uh, Matthew on on the scene to uh, talk about things from from his perspective as a new Democratic Party member of Parliament, the only Black member of that party uh, in a minority government setting. It's even more important that uh, these voices be heard. Um, and happy to see that he's on the Members of Parliament Black Caucus with with Greg Fergus and Ahmad Hussein. Uh, it means that we have an, another strong voice to speak on our behalf. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the, the opportunity to provide that very, very brief um, uh, update. If people have questions, they can go to the UNDPAD site. Uh, we'll post that information in the chat. Uh, so thanks again, and, uh, uh, and uh, have a great meeting. Dr. Bide. Thank you so much, Richard, for keeping us up, keeping us present and in the moment on uh, what UNDPAD is doing, the PUSH Coalition. And I just want to say for people, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. And uh, Richard is monitoring questions and comments in the chat, and we'll get them as much as possible with time permitting to Matthew. And as we mentioned, we said Matthew, 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 but let's give a proper introduction. Matthew Green is the NDP Member of Parliament for Hamilton Centre, critic for National Revenue, Public Services and Procurement, Treasury Board, Deputy Critic for Ethics. Uh, does he have time to do anything else? Yes, he's also on the Black Caucus, in part of the Black Caucus. So he has a lot of stuff going on, but he is uh, making time today to share with everybody. We had a conversation, a group of us this afternoon with Matthew, and he said he did about 15 interviews yesterday, but he still has time for us. He makes time and has time for us. So let's welcome Matthew Green. How are you, Matthew? Hey, what an incredible opportunity uh, to be here with all these beautiful black faces today. Can I just... I just want to share with folks tonight uh, about what's on my heart and not necessarily what's on my mind, if that's cool. If you have the ability and you can go ahead and use your cameras, 
I need to share with you that it's critically important for me uh, to just feel the love and to feel the energy that, 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 that we have in our community, our resilient community. It is so incredible to be here with you all. I see so many familiar faces. And I want to begin first by um, acknowledging something, Dr. Vibe, and I hope I don't take this offline, but I want to acknowledge the trauma that our community has faced. And I did an interview that's going to air tomorrow, and I just, I want to situate the conversation, and then I'll set it aside. I will compartmentalize the trauma, but I need to say this. In the interview that I did yesterday with CTV on West Block, it'll air tomorrow, Brother Fergus was on it. Something hit me with that conversation about lynching in the States. Because in the practice of lynching, they would leave black bodies hanging from trees as a message and a form of psychological terrorism to our communities to ensure that we stayed in our place. And why I raised that is because the over proliferation of the, the videos of, of police uh, execution and murders of black uh, men and women in our streets it, 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 tr it triggered me, that conversation around lynching triggered me yesterday uh, to a point where I needed to just go ahead and share that trauma with you so you understand where I'm at. Because where I'm at right now is back and forth between blind rage and weeping. So if you get that from me tonight, that's coming from a very real and raw place. Um, but I'll share that, that these check-ins with community are what give me the courage, the motivation, the inspiration. So I'm not here to... to, to um, I'm not here to motivate anybody. I'm here to be motivated by you all. Received, received, Matthew. That's great. So I've got some questions for Matthew to, uh, to share his answers and his feelings from his heart about. So uh, let's get it going. So the first question I have for you is, what are your thoughts on the George Floyd killing and the impact it's had on Canada and the world? You know what? I'll be honest with you. I... Um... The George Floyd killing, it, it didn't get me in the same way that Regis Paquette's cousin, who was wandering around Toronto housing with his Instagram in distress, with his cousin on the ground covered in, in, a, in a tarp, saying like, somebody come down here. Somebody help me. They murdered my sister. They murdered my cousin, whatever, you know, like that, that rattled me. And I'll be honest with you, like, I really I really try for my own mental health not to focus on what's happening in the States because it does two things. It provides trauma with no outlet. And what I mean by that is we are traumatized by the brutality of the violence, but what it does is it creates a disassociation in our mind about the violence that happens here. Raise your hand if you remember uh, um, Brother Loku. Raise your hand if you remember uh, Brother Abdi Rahman Abdi and all the other untold black murders in this country. So I try to situate my compartmentalization, if I could be honest, to make sure that I focus on the things that I can control here. Did you, did you at least watch the video? No. Why not? I, it just like, to what end? You know, like to what end? Like I, I, I have a hard enough time as it is uh, working in systems of white supremacy. And you know, you know, like for our community and, and, and shout out to all the black women who are on here because this hits black women more, more so than it does men. But this, 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 um, this, this meme of the angry black person, right? Like I have to walk a very fine line. When people tune in, if you hear me speak, there's very rarely that you hear me speak in that house of commons without a tone of anger and rage. Like you can hear it in the way that I speak. I speak different than some of those folks, than most of those folks in the house because I'm not disassociated from it. I'm not dealing with anti-black racism hypothetically. <laughs> so, um, so again, I, I'm for my own mental health. I don't need to see uh, snuff films. I don't need to see the bodies hanging from the tree to know that shit is real. Hey. Absolutely. I got some comments here already. Juliet is saying, we hear you, we feel you, we see you, Matthew. Part of dealing with trauma is to speak to it that exists and allow yourself to feel it. And uh, Richard is also saying, I hear you, Matthew. Th though you hadn't seen the killings, but you're just seeing what's going on, what effect from where you're sitting has it had effect on Canada, these events? Well, and, look, and, and also in the world. Look, let's not, let's not get it twisted about where we're at right now. Where we're at is not new. 
No. And, and if you look at Andrew Loco and Black Lives Matter, they set the stage for this discussion. I don't want to externalize where we're at right now. And I don't want to discredit the work that happened in Canada by black sisters, by, by queer, you know, folks who are on the front lines doing this work as they have generation after generation to get to where we're at. What it's done is, you know, Floyd Paquette and now recently Chantel Moore, who's not black, obviously, but indigenous. It has, it has, I think, punched through or pierced white liberalism in ways that are irrefutable. It's irrefutable now with the, with the preponderance. I mean, the list is even too long for me to list how many black bodies have been murdered in these streets in Canada, never mind the States. So I always want to make sure any conversation that starts with Floyd needs to be redirected to Re Sister Regis, to Loku, to uh, Abdi Rahman, Abdi, because that's right here, fam. And the distance, the cognitive distance about George Floyd is white folks can be in solidarity with George Floyd. Our prime minister can be in solidarity with black people in the States and George Floyd. But what's he saying about anti-black uh, execution here? This man appointed Bill Blair, who's the architect of the largest program of racial profiling in the country, the first and most significant program of racial profiling in the country under Tavis, the former chief of Toronto police, is now the minister of public safety. For those who haven't had a chance to check out my work, I called the man out in the House of Commons, first to denounce the practice of street checks and racial profiling. When he did that, I followed up, given his statements, would he now apologize to the black community for the irreparable harm that he has caused to the black community? And I got crickets. <laughs> what, when, when, you hear, when you get the crickets, how, do you, how does it make you feel in your heart? Um, I'm not surprised. Like my self-care is, is speaking my truth. You know, there's a, there's a really, I was on this today. If you guys are on Twitter, I, I put my tag there. Make sure you add me up. But I share some, I always share music because, you know, that's how we deal with our trauma. And there's a brother here in Hamilton, a Juno award-winning blues singer named Harrison Kennedy. And he's got a song that says, tell the truth and shame the devil, you know? And I'll leave that to you. Like we can say the devil is a lot of things, but the devil to me is, is anti-black racism. The devil to me is, is um, all the evils that we're facing in society right now. Um, but that's how I feel when I'm in there. And I actually feel okay knowing that I put the question because every time I stand up and speak in the House of Commons, that goes down in the Hansard, which is the history of this country's government. And we are saying things for the first time in the house that have never been said. In my first statements, I called out white supremacy. I call out anti-black racism. I call out anti-indigenous um, brutality as well. So I feel good about my work, you know? What, let me delve a little deeper. You've been so kind to share with us how you're feeling. What are, what are the sentiments or what are the feelings from other parliamentarians that are willing to share with you? I think out of respect to my colleagues, I, I won't claim to speak on their behalf, but I will draw attention to the experience, the recent experience of Sister Sel Selena Chavanez. You know, that was a sister who just refused. You want to talk about strength? She refused to be broken by a system. That's big sister status right there. If you don't know Sister Selena, if you haven't reached out to her at any point in time from across the country, folks who are tuned in, check in on her work. To this moment, she's still working, even though she didn't run again, she wasn't reelected again. She's been very public about the impacts of anti-black racism on her mental health and has been for me a source of inspiration. Um, and you know, I, I don't think, I, like I, I will not ever, you will not catch me call in or call out black members of parliament ever, even if I don't agree with their policies because it's already hard enough as it is as a black person in government. Right. I just don't do it as my own practice. I know the white supremacist will, and I know that other people will. I stay away from it. Excellent. When I, when I say the UN, the UN Decade for People of African Descent, what does that mean to you? Well, I think what's inherent there is the experience of the diaspora. So when we encapsulate what it means to be of descent, I am of African descent. My father is a, 
African Canadian. And I think it speaks to the way in which the transatlantic slave trade took our people and flung them across the world. And that we uh, come from a continent that is rich in history and in culture, uh, that has you know, extreme resilience and brilliance and is descended from kings and queens, uh, scientists and mathematicians. But in the broader context, you know, I, I, I draw back on the reports that came out of the UN uh, Human Rights Council, the working group for experts on the people of African descent, where they came to Canada. The United Nations came to Canada to tell the world what we already knew, which is that anti-Blackness is a feature, not a bug, of the foundation of this country. And so for my history, my own personal story is that I come from the, um, from the place of, 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 of freedom seekers. And when I was a kid, like I would, I would actively, when I was 12 and I was just getting into a knowledge of self, Malcolm X was out, the movie, you know, Public Enemy was number one. And, um, and I remember thinking like I was the son of runaway slaves because that was the context for which blackness was uh, presented in these communities at least for me and my educational experience. And then I came to realize as I, as I grew into myself that no, I wasn't the son of runaway slaves. I was the son of freedom seekers and that slavery was something that happened to our people. And that the UN had to come to Canada to remind us to, to uh, counter the racial amnesia in this country, that we had slavery. You know, check out the execution that happened in Montreal when they blame that sister for burning down the city. Check out Matthew DaCosta is one of the first, uh, you know, people like the list goes on and on and on. And so when the UN has to come to Canada to talk about anti-blackness for institutions of whiteness to finally come to grips with what we already know, that's a problem. So around the world, the decade states that we have a responsibility to put global focus on the global inequalities against people of African descent. And it's not just a North American thing, fam. We have millions, more Africans went to the South. They went to Brazil, they went to South America and Central America, than they did reach the shores of North America, right? So, so this is an opportunity to be hyper-focused in the emancipation, the liberation theory, uh, the social and economic inequality, particularly the economic inequality, to be empowered, about the truth of our, of our ancestry, to be reconnected to the root of continental Africa. You know, when we talk to the sisters and brothers who are out there today, you might say, I'm from Jamaica, I'm from Barbados, I'm from Bahamas. I'm like, for a moment, you know, for a moment you are, but the root is always and will always be continental Africa. Great, and uh, people for watching this live, if you have a question or comment, please put it in the chat room. We're not taking any live visual questions or comments, so please put them in the chat room. As I said, Richard Sharp is monitoring them and the questions are flying. So I wanna get through this conversation with Matthew and then have him answer some questions that are coming from our audience. So next question, I wanna delve a little bit deeper. Um, the UN put UN DPAD push coalition has tried to engage your leader on initiatives to support the UN decade for people of African descent. What is your party's position on UN DPAD? Yeah, so you know we ran with an anti with, with an anti racism policy in 2019. Uh, I'll share with you this is not news that in 2019 when our leader took leadership 2018-2019, uh, he himself faced significant racism across the board from the media. I'll even suggest like from within our own party, like if I could be candid. And so it took him a while to kind of find his way. And, you know, in lobbying and in politics, much like life, it's all relational. So I'll admit, and I, I can't speak on behalf of the leader. Uh, I only ever speak on behalf of myself. Uh, but I know that the party has supported me in the work that I do. They've never tried to silence me. They've never tried to walk me back on speaking out against the injustices. So when I talk about doing 15 interviews in a syndicated CBC radio circuit yesterday, I was talking about essentially defunding the police, which is a radical position for an elected official to take. 
Not a new position. I took that on as a city councilor when I was taking on racial profiling and street checks. And the reason why I joined our party is because as a city councilor, nobody would talk about racial profiling and street checks. Nobody. Myself, Mohammed Sali, uh, you know, we're pushing to get the conversation outside of Toronto because Toronto wanted, the, the, the province and the Liberal government at the time wanted to make it a conversation about Toronto, but we knew it was happening across the country. And so when we went to the NDP, it was actually Jagmeet who was the first person who came out against it because he had that lived experience. He spoke out against racial profiling and street checks before anybody did officially at the legislature. The party federally never talked about it. It wasn't an issue. These issues don't become issues until we actually get that seat at the table, fam. So that's like, for me, you know, we were in this moment and I recognized that when Jumeet was running, I had an opportunity to support for the first time in history, a racialized person to lead a national party. Never happened before. And I had a choice to either be on the sidelines or be engaged. I got and I signed up a thousand memberships for that brother and his leadership. Because I knew that in supporting people internally to partisan politics, I have made my seat at the table to demand that there be a racial uh, discrimination policy in our federal platform, to demand that when I was elected, that I got to speak on these issues without censor. And they've, they've done that. They have fully supported me. In fact, I'll, I'll even go further to say that um, when I went into Ottawa last week, they gave me, there was eight spots for our party to have. They gave me four of them. I had a, a motion that I put forward, which was a hate crime uh, motion to strengthen hate crimes. It was, it was for unanimous consent. The Bloc Québécois, one of the, you know, a very problematic ethno, you know, national party, they rejected it, but the party allowed me to put that forward. I had a speech, uh, you know, I had a question and question period and a statement and statement in, um, in question period that dealt specifically with the loss of uh, Mr. Leonard Rodriguez and to allow me to demand from the government the segregated race-based data. I did that on a Tuesday and I was gonna drive home. And I ended up staying in the, in the, in the region for a little while and the, the party called me back in on Black Tuesday and said, you have five minutes, you can say whatever you want. You don't get that in partisan politics. So I got a chance to stand up in the House of Commons and point out that the, that the Prime Minister was failing in the House to lead on anti-Black racism and to demand that they start collecting the desegregated data and to call out Bill Blair and his practices of street checks, which we know disproportionately harm uh, racialized communities. So those are all significant things. And what I want to acknowledge, I'm not going to run around this because we, we did preface this in another conversation, that it was probably very likely or very likely difficult for the coalition to get a meeting with the leader prior to this. I want to acknowledge that. I'm not here to apologize about it. Politics are relational. You have a relationship and this conversation will include the national leadership of our party. And if I can, uh, to the best of my ability for our regional sisters and brothers, happy to put you in connection with uh, folks that are on the ground provincially as well, coast to coast. That's my commitment to you. Okay, good, good, good stuff. Keep the stuff coming on the comments, folks. My next conversation piece with you, Matthew, how do we concretely move forward from marches to action to address anti-Black racism across all institutions within Canada? Here's the great news, okay? Here's what's amazing about this. Uh, you've already started. So what I mean by that is that you will not find leadership in elected bodies. And I know that sounds strange to say for a civic leader. What you find are thermometers. And what, what the community is, is a thermostat. And when you organize and mobilize like you all have over the last couple of years, we did a phenomenal event. Shout out to everybody who made it to the Hill. Uh, when you're out there, you know, I'm, I'm cynical. I'm always like, man, this is more about photo ops than it is about action. Uh, but those photo, those photo ops are actually, they're markers. They're markers in time. There's like digital dust. You know, they, this government cannot claim like it doesn't know the issues. You brought the issues in your briefs. I met with you in my office on the Hill. We had receptions. Uh, you're putting in the work. You are 
the thermostat on the discussion. And the action is coming. So, you know, the breakthrough that's happening right now with white, white liberals, and when I say white liberals, please understand that to not mean big L liberals, but I mean white folks who consider themselves progressive in a way, aspirational, um, you know, but haven't really had this kind of self-reflection that's necessary to situate the conversation here in Canada. Uh, that we're now well situated and through the leadership of Greg Fergus, I'm gonna share that very clear, his leadership on the Black Caucus, uh, your, your points have punched through. Your points are going to form a framework for a national discussion. That's significant. I am very optimistic, more so than I was last week even, that through the, through the Black Caucus, um, and again, like I'm cynical. When I see Justin Trudeau take a knee, I'm like, shit, don't take a knee, take a stand. Um, but what happens is when he takes that knee and he goes into, the, into these white liberal spaces of feel goodness, he's boxing himself in. He cannot now, with having a black member of the opposition, take a knee without taking a stand because he knows every time I stand up, I'm gonna call that man out. I get to look the prime minister, I get to look Bill Blair in the eye and I get to you know, tell the truth. And so that's where we're at and, and it's because of your work. Like know that these web series, uh, know that the organizing calls that you guys have been on, uh, I can share with you and I hope, I hope I'm not telling tales at a school. You know, Richard and I have been in constant contact. Today, uh, I spent an hour and a half on the line with, um, with Greg Fergus with uh, Senator, um, uh, uh, Senator um, Moore. And, and uh, I've been back and forth with Ahmed Hussein on this call about what was about to go down right now. And it's because you all have been the thermostat. You see, without that pressure, without the work in framing the discussion, we would have left it to staffers and bureaucrats. And I'm not saying that derogatory for anybody out there who happens to be a staffer or a bureaucrat to set the table, but the community has set the table in the discussion. Your asks are, are on the record. So I'm really excited, man, and I'm thankful for your work. And I need you guys, every person to know who's logged in tonight, that your work is historic. And what I mean by that is that when I stand up in the house and I move a motion, or I'm in committee and I move a motion, or when uh, other actions are underfoot, and they are, and I'm not gonna preempt our caucus, but we are organizing, uh, and I think that we are organizing in lockstep with the frame that you guys have put forward. Also, my final conversation piece before we start taking the questions off the chat. In your mind and heart, what does success look like for African, Caribbean, and Black people living and working in Canada? I can't talk about success without talking about liberation. And... I won't allow capitalism to define success because I think that denigrates the value of the work and the working class that make up, you know, the vast majority of our community. Recognizing many of you online right now are professionals and are very, uh, doing very well and are very successful. But when I talk about liberation, I talk about uh, liberation from anti-blackness in our schools, in our healthcare, in our uh, prison systems. I talk about liberation in our economy right, to have a, a democratic economy that centers the people in our community in ways in which we haven't been centered. I talk about a liberation in our knowledge of self to begin to uh, get beyond some of our own internal and lateral violence that tends to happen uh, by having a shared kind of sense of what our value and purpose is in the country. And that's a super complex thing, right? Like we are in Canada probably we have the most plurality in diversity of blackness in this country than anywhere in the world, anywhere. Like the United States has a pretty, you know, homogenous experience in terms of uh, Africans of, 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 you know, descendants of slavery with whatever immigration patterns have. But the, the, the population here in this country is more diverse than I would suggest anywhere around the world. So that does mean coming together in these types of organizing bodies and recognizing that there's gonna be other organizing bodies, right? Um, that might not be 100% aligned to us, but I need to put the caveat. I'm not talking about solidarity and representation with everybody. 
because I will never align myself with members of the black community who work against the black community's interest. Will not do it. I cannot do it. And, and I would suggest that we ought not do it collectively as a group, that when people are out there pushed to the forefront of conversations and used and weaponized against us, then uh, we also need to be aware of that and ready to respond accordingly. All right, so let's get into a number of questions for Ooh, you. So, <laughs> so, let's do it. I'm set. I got my comfortable chair. <laughs> so first question up from Robin. He's saying George Floyd's death has created a moment where white folks want to give black folks what we want. One of our asks is for the government to set aside 3.5% for procurement for black business. How should we ask for that to increase our chances of getting that? Well, you already have, and you, you have in the, um, in the briefing uh, that we had when you came to the Hill. And so I want to share with you a draft motion. So there's, there's a bit of a process, and this process isn't sexy. So, uh, so it means that it's, it's like, yes, it'll be part of a, a, a very direct and immediate ask, and it's something that um, is going to come. But one of the steps that I took that was informed by your work and through your advocacy is I actually drafted a motion uh, at committee. And so what happens is, is you have like the House of Commons, and I do this one-on-one because I just want to assume that not everybody knows exactly how federal government works. I'm not doing it to insult anybody's intelligence. But the House of Commons uh, has parliament and then it has committees. And in the committees, there are working groups that deal with the studies and substantive issues that, if, that are the ministries and the mandates of, of all departments across the, the government. And so the, government, the, the committee that I'm on just so happens to be public services and procurement, which is wild because let's think about this. Out of all the black bodies in the House of Commons, when you're government, you don't, if you're not on cabinet, you, you're not really government, you're a backbencher. So I just need to say that. It just is what it is. So the only person that we have actually forming cabinet in the prime minister's office is Brother Hussein, who is, who's constantly gets put in tough situations. I need to also state that. When you put a, a, a Somali refugee as the Minister of Immigration, that is problematic in and of itself. I want to put that there. So as a backbencher, you can't, you're not going to come out against your party, but I can. And so in my motion in public services and procurement, and because we're a small party, I just got named this because of my experience with City Hall. What I did is I put the following motion. I'm going to read the motion to you guys, and then I'm going to cut and paste it into the actual um, body of the, of the message so you guys get a sense for what it is it looks like. So I talk about, I'll, I'll save the, um, the preamble, that desegregated data related, related to businesses owned by underrepresented groups, Black, Indigenous, women, persons with disabilities, uh, between, I'm going to say 2015 and the present, uh, how many companies from underrepresented groups have secured contracts with PSAC? And then the second question, what are the value of these contracts? And then the third question, what are the number of businesses from underrepresented groups that have been screened and approved as accredited vendors? And then I go on to ask for the number and value of the set-aside contracts for these businesses. And then I ask for the number of subcontracts ended into, and that the data and best practices and reports resulted from their pilot projects be reported back. So to translate that for people who don't understand bureaucratic language, I took uh, the PUSH coalition and the, the, it wasn't just PUSH, it was the whole lobby experience that I had when you all came. And I distilled that, but I, I turned into Jeopardy, where I've, I'm now demanding from the government that they answer those questions. And then I, that they report back by August uh, 31st, which is a Monday, uh, Monday, August the 31st. So why I've done all of that is because I know they're going to come back with the information that's going to tell us what we already know, which is that their policies, their so-called gender-based plus analysis, which is how they, this liberal government frames uh, their equity, diversity, and inclusion mandate, at the plus is a very small add-on. Most of their equity and diversity has led to kind of white feminist uh, ascension within leadership in the country. And so what I'm calling the question on is the data and the actual evidence 
for then the next step is a very obvious, you know, September the house returns and we put the set asides out there on the table based on the data that they gave us. And then it becomes irrefutable. Okay. Because what they'll do, if we ask for the 3.5% now, they're going to say, we need to send it out. It needs to be studied. We're going to do consultations and they do the whole horse and pony show. And we're past talk fam. We're not doing that no more. Okay. Unless they want to pay you for your free labor, you know, then, <laughs> then maybe we can have them consult. Them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thanks for that response. Next question from Inga is asking, how did you respond to Premier Ford's initial comments of racism not being systemic in Canada as it is in the United States? Is anybody surprised though? <laughs> Am I supposed to pretend to be surprised? Am I supposed to be indignant when a bigot reveals their bigotry? <laughs> you know what I mean? Shout out to Waleed Kugali, who during the provincial election showed up at Doug Ford's town hall, stood out and called him out on racial profiling and street checks. And he basically said, I'm not changing a thing. He told us, you know, look, when they tell you who they are, believe them and don't be surprised. And if you know folks from our community who supported that waste man, please do uh, remind them that the first thing he did is come in and gut minimum wage, gut housing, gut social services. They attack our communities and cut our services to give tax breaks to the ultra wealthy. That's the game. That's always been the game. So do I expect Doug Ford to have critical race analysis? Hell no. Absolutely not. That's not news to me. Water is wet. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what, Matthew, as I said, we were chatting this afternoon, so you're going to come up with all cylinders tonight. We're feeling it, brother. Plain talk, man. This is all I got. And that's why I say put it live. I do live streams every day and I don't hold back because you know what? I don't have, uh, I, I, I don't have a gentleman's agreement with the establishment to play nice. Mm. And that's what power is. That's what, when you choose between Coke and Pepsi, it's a gentleman's agreement to play nice. Okay. All right. Well, there's like piles of questions. So let's keep it going. Next up, Lawrence is saying, can I ask what the exact agenda is to get funds to equal our race and the opportunities in this country? And who will be the group looking after the funds for disparate? And how will the funds be used? So there's a lot to that. And I think like a lot of what was asked in that question was act has actually been distilled in your website. So I don't know if somebody could put your website up in the link. And uh, that, was from, that was from Lawrence Fisher. Dr. Oh, yeah, so I, I need to say this. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna take a personal point of privilege right now and say shout out to LA Fisher, who was actually my football coach when I played uh, junior football in, in Halton region. So uh, we go way back 20 plus years to LA who uh, was really kind of you know what I mean? Early on being a, being a black role model in, in those times. So shout out to you. Uh, and it, as it relates to your question, the combination between the work that's happening within the coalitions, the BBPA and all the other folks, uh, shout out to, to, um, to the people who've been doing that work, all the coalition uh, folks. And, the, and really, I think the black caucus is actually going to step up to the plate, man. I have faith. I have faith that folks for the, for the first time in a long time um, are like everybody. And here's the other thing I need to state. I need to share with you that there are an extraordinary amount of non-black people who are allies in the black caucus, who are in senior levels of government, uh, who, are, who are liberals, uh, who also support this work. It doesn't do me any political favors to say that, but that's the truth. That, that is not just the handful of us. When you hear Black Caucus, it doesn't actually just mean the Black faces that are in the House and the Senate. There are many other people, particularly, and I'll, and I'll just call it what it is, particularly folks who represent our communities that have large Black populations. It's not lost on them that they need to be at the table to represent their constituents. And by and large, they've been doing a really good job doing it. Like, yeah, so. Next question comes from Kafkan 
social services. They're saying, where is the Black Caucus in terms of getting an apology from the PM? Do you think that, the fo that following his statement earlier this week, an apology to African Canadians would be a good place to start? So here's the T on that. That was my original, that was going to be my original flex when I stood up on Tuesday. I had it drafted. I was going for the PM. Because the challenge is, is like back channeling. When you back channel government, and a lot of you guys work in government, I know, uh, you end up getting managed. And you feel good when you leave the meeting. You feel like, gosh darn it, things, and then nothing happens. But when you say something in the house, it's irrefutable. The challenge is, my man dipped. He was out of there. He saw my name. I don't know if he saw my name, but he wasn't there when I got to call the question. So rather than take aim at him, I took aim at Bill Blair to apologize for street checks. Uh, but I do see that coming. And I, and I say that because uh, Senator Wanda has done incredible work uh, for those folks that are out in Nova Scotia, uh, talking about those critical issues, talking about making sure that the apology comes, that the acknowledgement of slavery comes, all the things that have happened to the Japanese, the Jews, the Italians, everybody else in this country who've been systematically uh, oppressed, except for maybe perhaps the, you know, the indigenous communities in a meaningful way. Uh, they just haven't done that for us. And again, my man's out there taking them selfies uh, on a knee, holding a Black Lives Matter shirt. Show me Black Lives Matter. So know this, if you don't say it soon, the man's gonna get the question from me directly. And shout out if you're a liberal staffer on here, please do give all this information back to, to the man them. Good stuff. Next conversation piece from Dave Lindsay saying, since we are the first peoples of the world as Africans, is it, it is time for us to have the same tax exemption as our indig indigenous brothers and sisters? So they're asking the question, should I no. be as, okay. No. Okay. No, let's not get it twisted. And sometimes I have these, like, and I'm not saying this to, to take away from the question or the person asking the question, but we need to be very clear as black people in the diaspora on these lands. These lands are indigenous lands. If you want reparations, then we can have that conversation. That's a different conversation. But in terms of like trying to create a false equivalency between the genocide and the dispossession of indigenous peoples in these lands would be akin to folks of South Asian descent who were brought to the continent of Africa, uh, trying to make a false equivalency between their experience and their claims to those lands in continental Africa. I say that because I've had some pretty like interesting conversations with folks about land acknowledgements. Some folks from our community just refuse to do land acknowledgement. We don't got to do no land. Yes, we do. We need to acknowledge the territories that we're on. Okay. Good. In my opinion. No, no problem. Uh, here's a comment from Sylvia Parrish. She says, we are hearing from black males who are being re-traumatized by what is, what is meaning, what is meaning shared via media. We need to have structural supports for these men, their families, and our communities. Do you have any comment for that in regards to, as she said, I just read it again. She says, we are hearing from black males who are being re-traumatized by, by what is being shared via the media. We need to have structural supports for these men, their families, and our communities. So I think what Sylvia is asking is, what are your thoughts in regards to having support, especially in the area of mental health for African Canadians, especially during this time? Yes. And I, and I also, if I could step back to gender, uh, you know, Sister Paquette, uh, you know, there, there are many black women who have been brutalized by these systems. And I don't want to pretend like that's not the case. And it is. And it is also the case that we need to have significant investments in mental health and significant investments in all the social determinants of health. When you look at housing, when you look at food security, when you look at job security, labor rights, human rights, we need all of those things. And we do need to have culturally appropriate uh, mental health supports because what is happening right now in our community for folks who are in crisis is that they're immediately criminalized. And what I mean by that is that the only avenue through which we can gain access to mental health supports is typically through either checking ourselves into an institution at the acute place or uh, by calling the police. 
And the police are called on us all the time when we're in duress. There have been 460 people involved in police, involved fatalities in this country in the last 15 years. I'm asking for the desegregated data to find out how many of those were black folks, how many of them were unarmed, you know? Um, how, and, and, and not even beyond that, I'm asking for data on all use of force incidents to get clear about that because mental health has been criminalized. We can't have a bad day like other people can in our workplaces, in our, you know, we can't have a case of the Mondays when we go to work or when we're on transit or when we're driving places. Because if we have that and we cop an attitude or we respond in a way that whiteness doesn't feel comfortable with, then that's a whole other subset of problems. Thank you for that one. Next up, Floyd Dean Charge Fi Charles Fidel from Kafkan Social Service says, do you, asking, do you know whether the Black Caucus intends to aggressively push towards a positive response to the recommendations made to Canada by the UN Expert Working Group for People of African Descent? Yes, strongly, in ways that I think will be unprecedented in Canadian government. Like, we're in the new civil rights. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, want to sit, I want to contextualize this in the leadership that comes from this group and from all the other coalition groups, uh, folks that have been on the front lines for a long time. I need you to know that you are validated. You, you are actually historical figures. I know that sounds strange to hear, but you are actually historical figures who are setting the table on a historic conversation at a point in time. And I know for many of you, particularly our elders in the community who have been through so much trauma and have been through so many iterations of this type of getting close to and being in proximity of power, but maybe not necessarily grappling it. This is the moment that we're gonna grapple that power. And so uh, I, I have confidence with my friends across the way, with my sisters and brothers from the liberal government. That doesn't do me any political favors to say, but I feel solidarity with them in ways that I, I wouldn't have in the past and in ways the public can't even see, which I'm sharing with you because I want you to leave to know that your work is not for naught. You know, your struggles haven't been in vain. Like we're gonna push on this. Now, it's not perfect. We're not gonna get everything that we ask for. We're gonna be clear about that, right? Like we're gonna, we're gonna push and we're gonna push and we're gonna push and we're gonna be radical and we're gonna to continue to push and we're gonna get substantive change um, embedded. And then my hope is we get super political in the next election. All right, next conversation piece from Karifka, Canada asking how do we come together as a people whether we agree or disagree with each other's positions how do we get rid of the ego we complement other communities how they get along so how does everyone or everyone think we should put our own unity into practice the only way in my opinion i should, this is all my own opinion but this goes back to liberation theory the only way that we can have unity is if we're talking about the same thing I am not in solidarity with people who are willing to keep our status quo structures in place because they benefit, because they got a seat at the table or they got a little crumb. So unity can only be, solidarity can only be defined through shared values, in my opinion, not skin color. All skin folk are not kin folk. Take it for what it is. There are black members of our community who are doing harm to our community. That's not ego, that's facts. And so we need to get clear about what our shared values are. Now, that doesn't mean like, look, I am very left wing. I, I am not just talking about defunding the police. Uh, I'm not just talking about dismantling white supremacy. I'm talking about dismantling capitalism. And that is radical in our community because we have had to rely on capitalism to get whatever kind of meager supports that we get or to build our own success in the ways that we define it. But what I'm talking about is that you can't uncouple anti-black racism and white supremacy from capitalism. That is actually the very essence of that. And so we need to start to talk about democratizing our economy so that workers and working class people have a greater share at the table. When you look at COVID right now, and the fatalities, and we know that 85% plus are connected to long-term care facilities. We know the people that are in the long-term care facilities are mostly white folks, but we know the people that are, um, that are um, providing them service 
and are taking care of them are our folks. And so when you talk about Leonard Rodriguez, when you talk about all the black people who have died at COVID because their workplace wouldn't give them protective equipment, they weren't already being paid a living wage. They don't have benefits and pensions in place. They got to work at three or four locations just to make enough money to get by because maybe they couldn't get in as RNs and nurses to the mainstream healthcare facilities. That's what I'm talking about in terms of liberation. And that's what I want to unify around. Good stuff. Next conversation piece. Um, and just building from that last question that the organization asked, saying, can we, uh, asking, should the leadership example start from our leaders with their families? Um, I don't know what that means. Like define leadership. You know, like when we talk about flat organizing, I believe in that. Look, there's no waiting for Superman. There's no messianic savior coming to save us from ourselves. If you want to have strong families, take care of your family. Start there. Start internal to your own home. Model what you want to see to the rest of the community, to your church groups, to your cultural associations. Be that person. Be a good person. Uh, know that trauma is intergenerational and it is complex. And that if you're going to be in a position to kind of look to other people, you know, I would suggest that first we look internally and then we hold ourselves accountable. And we also have grace for people who are infallible. Now, I'll also state with a caveat, that doesn't mean all people. There was a certain senator who uh, targeted a young black uh, a girl, she was a girl at the time, I'm not even gonna say woman, that uh, quite frankly, we can have no space for, we can have no, no uh, patience for, no explaining for, no excuses for. There are predators also within our communities as it relates to uh, violence. And we need to root that out as well and call that out as well. Well said. So we're coming to the top of the hour, Matthew. How much time, much more time can you give us? Because I know- All the, all the time in the world, fam. Okay. <laughs> I see those smiling faces and I appreciate each and every one of them. Okay, so next question is a can little Can I do a shout out? Yeah, absolutely. It's your show. I'm just steering the ship, man. Shout out. I already got, I already got Sister Samuel, who's doing incredible work in the trade unions. By the way, if you are a black member of a union, and you have feelings about the way that your union treats you, if you don't feel like you belong to, um, to, the, to the power structure of your union, there is a phenomenal group in this country called the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. Critically important organization. Uh, Sister Samuel has been integral to that and does great work for educators. And I have to go local and, I, and I'm gonna, at the risk of you know, missing people, I'm gonna go ahead and say, um, when I came back, to Hamilton in 2004, 2005. Most of my friends had moved away. I'd gone away to university. I came back. I didn't really feel connected to the community. I got tapped on my shoulder by, I'm going to call, she doesn't like you that I call her this, but I'm going to call her this. Auntie Evelyn Myrie tapped me on my shoulder, brought me into the African Canadian Caribbean Association. We started a program called Afrobics with my super seniors. We did fitness to, you know, Calypso and reggae and all types of great stuff there at ACA. And then at the time, uh, Auntie Evelyn was also uh, integral to the John C. Holland Awards and was the chair there and really connected me to community. And I say that because if you're an elder out there, if you're, if you're a big sister or an auntie status or an uncle status or big brother status, I saw some young um, sisters and brothers who popped on, please tap them on their shoulder. You know what I mean? Like this idea in our community, this is relevant, where our elders always know what's best and young people are only to be seen and not heard is very detrimental to, to the succession planning of our leadership. And if it wasn't for people like, like Evelyn, uh, who, who really kind of, you know, built a platform for me to allow me to build platform for other people, uh, I certainly wouldn't be there. So I, I just want to go ahead and hail them up right now. Thank you so much. So the next question we have is a little bit, I see you waving. All right, there's a little bit of a preamble, but we'll get, I think it's important in today's conversation. Um, organization called Youth and Diaspora. 
They're saying, good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. When I heard about this call, I thought it would be a good way to continue to be involved and introduce myself formally as I just returned from a peaceful protest here in Milton. My name is Arthur Amdi and I'm the founder of Youth and Diaspora. It is a grassroots leadership movement empowering young people of African descent to obtain the necessary resources to be represented in various sectors as leaders for decision making. I just want to get down here and to develop the diaspora where they live and their respective countries back home. We're building up leaders not only of tomorrow but of today who have don't have a voice in critical decisions that impact their everyday life. What I would like to hear is what can we do for youth and young professionals of African descent here in Canada to provide them with the necessary resources, expertise, and opportunities to be represented so that in turn, we can impact decisions and make a difference here in Canada while globally aligning with the United Nations SDG as we're currently in the international decade for people of African descent and in the capital letters here, decade of action. I love it. Can I do something, Dr. Vibe? Can you Absolutely. give me another point of political privilege? This is what I call praxis. This is what I call, um, you know, uh, uh, eating my own cooking. If the young brother, is it a brother? Is it Arthur? If Arthur is online right now, what I would like to do, Arthur, is ask you to unmute. And I would ask you to please provide to this group uh, whatever comfortable contact information you have. And I would ask that the experts, the professionals, the aunties and the elders, after hearing from this brother, to please reach out to him and to, and to let's provide him with some support and some wraparound care. So brother Arthur, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthew, for, for giving me this opportunity. Dr. Vibe, I really appreciate the fact that you guys are doing this. Um, it's, it's amazing. My name is Arthur Madi, like I said, our website is youthindiaspora.org. My email, my personal email is Arthur, at youthindiaspora.org. So if anyone would want to get in contact with me or my team, um, again, you can reach out to me and I'm really, really open to help. I, I said this to, you know, it's so interesting how this call, I said it to LA, like you were speaking, Matthew, you know, he was also at the protest. I said, we have a little window of opportunity right now because I know in my spirit that they're waiting for everything to go back to normal so this can just be brushed off. So we really need to, you know, focus on execution now, action now, because if we don't do that, this is just going to be, you know, another thing. So I, I really, you know, think we need to focus on speed, um, you know, things that can get done right away and being implemented immediately. And I really think we, we should do that ASAP, like yesterday. Um, so yeah, Arthur at youthindiaspora.org and youthindiaspora.org. Instagram, Amazing. that's where the org. Thank you. Yeah, put, put all that, put all your, your context up there, but this is what I'm talking about with platform. You know what I mean? If we have, I have a responsibility. If I have a platform and I'm talking about sharing it with youth, we just got to go ahead and share it with the youth and, and, and build their capacity. Do you think about in this, in this chat right now, I don't know how many people are on, but it doesn't even matter. I'm going to go ahead and say there are hundreds of years of experience, governance experience. When I say governance, I mean governance for nonprofits, governance for actual government, uh, organizational capacity, leadership, uh, all of that stuff is here. And if we can continue to kind of network in this way and build out for these, for these young people, man, I got a lot of faith in young people today. So let's do that. All right, next question from Edith saying, great job, Matthew. Can caucus start discussions about education curricula, including African history? Young people do not know about slavery and colonialism. Amen to that. Uh, I will say, so there's a couple of things. Uh, obviously education is provincial, right? It's a, there's, a, there's a provincial mandate through section 91, 92, which are the divisional levels of government. Um, that make education curriculum provincial. Having said that, the Black Caucus, and, and shout out to Brother Michael Koto, again, another brother who is a historic figure. I'm going to say, I'm going to say this about, about Michael Koto. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're new Democrats out there wondering why I'm talking about so many liberals, it's just because it is what it is right now. Um, Michael Koto has actually delivered more money for the Black community as one individual minister than anybody has in the history of all government. When, when Michael went out with the anti-racism directorate, he recognized that the Toronto Police Service was spending $80 million a year in policing a division that, that is responsible for Jane and Finch. 
So he said, like, that's wild. How, how are we spending so much money on policing these kids every year when we're not investing in social determinants of health? So he set aside the Black Youth Action Plan. I'm sure many of you are familiar, Tropicana and others. You know, we were at those regional meetings, uh, you know, uh, CAFCAN, like lots of other folks were there. Um, and he delivered $50 million, like, like $10 million a year. That was real money. And I say that because, you know, there, there are ways in which we can uh, begin to lobby the provincial level of government uh, through school boards and, and, and more importantly, not more importantly, as importantly, having our people be elected at school boards. When you look at what happened to, um, to that family, to that sister out in, in Peel, uh, sister, I want to say her name was Charlene where the school board, Nancy Elgie, went ahead and, and, and called this woman a nigger, like right there, no, like no thought, no nothing. These are the people who are responsible for, uh, you know, ex policies around expulsion. We already know who's disproportionately expelled from schools, discipline, all these other things. So there are ways that we could put direct political pressure on uh, both the province and local school boards to ensure that the curriculum is put in place. I will share for Nova Scotia that I believe we could, we can invite uh, Tony Inns into the conversation. And the reason why I brought up Michael Cotto originally before I got sidetracked on the, on the accolades is because Michael Cotto extended the black caucus to a meeting that included members from all levels of government together. We're going to do that again so that every single black elected official across the country, and we have some good city councilors, shout out to Mohammed Sali, Area Kaya Banga, like there's so many to list, school board trustees, we bring them all together. And I think what'll happen is we'll come out with a national statement representing all incredible uh, leadership on these critical issues. But education is certainly one of them. All right, next question we have here is from Robin. Yeah, in regards to ending capitalism, what do you think about cooperatives? Absolutely. That's, so this is it, man. This is the challenge we get into. When I talk about ending capitalism, people think immediately authoritarian communism. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about owning the means to our production in a way that is, when you hear co-ops, when the workers own their own businesses, that is extremely powerful. That is a democratic economy. When when people get together and, and build cooperative housing, this is another place where we have missed out. And there may be examples, so forgive me if I've missed them, but in my city, we have Italian housing cooperatives, Ukrainian housing cooperatives. We have all this affordable social housing by all these cultural ethnic groups, but we don't have it for our community. And I know that there's some really astute developers. I think about uh, the brother Dreamcatcher. I think about Mr. Jane and Finch, like all these people who have real good knowledge on real estate development, how we can decommodify or take the profit out of housing so that our people can have affordable housing. When you talk about co-ops for work, one of the reasons why we have been excluded from this capitalist economy is because we've been redlined. Our neighborhoods have been redlined from getting business loans. They just won't give it to us. I was a small business owner. I owned a small business for 10 years, not because I was a capitalist, but because I knew that I didn't fit into their systems as an employee. Way too outspoken. And so I was like, once I realized this is not going to work, like many people who have been systemically excluded from the economy, what do we do? We start our own businesses hair care products, barbers, like all the traditional businesses. And then you look at all the other ways in which we've started our own businesses. Not necessarily because we're inherently a, a capitalist class of people, but out of necessity. So you look at, you know, I'm going to use Koreans as an example, or, or Asians as an example, or South Asians as an example. When they come over, they pool their money together and they lend it out at low interest rates to their own people to be able to help get their businesses on track. We haven't got there yet. We haven't got there yet. So there's economic liberation theories on some Marcus Garvey stuff that we can do to help support our communities where it doesn't involve having to go to Scotia or CIBC to ask for a loan. Well said, my man. It's access to capital, right? Like we just don't have it. Next question from Michael. How do we eliminate the conscious and unconscious bias 
in government staffing processes and promotions to the level uh, promotions to level the playing field. So here's something that also may be radical. And I'm going to say this for our self care. Repeat after me. It is not our job to dismantle white supremacy. Let's say that again. It is not our job nor our responsibility to dismantle white supremacy or to solve anti-black racism. Not our responsibility. It's their responsibility. And what we need to do is have systems in place that hold them accountable to actually do it, which is why when we call the question, like I did in my motion, for all that information, the information is what it is. They can say and spin. Here's the language that governments use, and I'll be partisan for a moment and suggest that liberals are the best at this. Justin Trudeau taking a knee was very intentional. They will say we are working with, we are speaking to, we are working very hard towards. That's the language that's used to kind of quell us in our questions, in our seeking of justice. So I'm just saying like, don't tell me about the pain, show me the baby. What have you done? You know what I mean? What have you done for me lately? That's what I'm talking about. And when we put that there, it becomes irrefutable. If you have a policy that is about gender-based analysis plus, you've already told me that equity, diversity, and inclusion is an add-on. That if you don't have policies that are directly related to this dismantling um, racism, the prime minister can stand up and say racism is real all he wants. You can go to protest rallies and kneel. Like I said before, get up, get in the house, and get stuff done. All right. Next up, Queen Kokoi. I hope I got your name right. If I did, it's my head, not my heart in the air. Um, from Black Speculative Arts Movement, CI. What initiatives, if any, are in place for supporting the development and sustainable funding of Black grassroots organizations? Very important. So one of the early successes that you all had was the $25 million set aside. I have been, I have been flippant. I'll be honest with you. I have been flippant in my uh, communications with the liberal government because I tell them it's a drop in the bucket. $25 million isn't like, it's nothing to like shake a stick at, but um, we need to do a lot more. Uh, and I'm hopeful that that money starts to flow now. I've been, I've been assured that that money is actually gonna to start to flow. And I, and I do have to say, you know, I'm cynical when announcements are made during elections. I really am, because there's no commitment to it. But I'll also go further to say that the, the, the start of this parliament was extraordinary and that there wasn't really an opportunity for us to get, um, to get going on it in the ways that I think this liberal government would have liked to. So I'm gonna give them a pass on that. I'm to understand though that it's gonna flow and I believe that it's gonna flow through three bodies. Uh, I think Tropicana is one of them. There's a group out of Montreal and there's a group out of Halifax. Forgive me if I don't have them off the top of my head. So that money will get dispersed out through the community. Uh, and and my, my commitment is to make sure that's just the beginning. All right. Okay, can I also just say how integral arts and, and culture are to sure, our community? Absolutely. Because it's the only thing they can't really steal. You know, it's the only thing they can't steal from us. It's been said. I, I didn't make that up. Like, that's something that we need to hold near and dear to. We need to support it. We need to value our artists, right? We really need to value our artists. I know sometimes it's tough um, in our communities when people are trying to scrape to get by economically. Uh, but I think those investments in grassroots organizations, in artist-run organizations, when you talk about education, what better place to educate, to have a popular education of our people than through the arts? An example of that is tomorrow, I'm going to be on an Instagram Live with an incredible new artist called Havaya Mighty. This sister, like, yo, you need to check out this sister. She's going to be a international, she'll, she'll be the, like the Canada's female Drake. She's one of the best hip hop lyricists I've heard come out of this country in a long time. She was on um, Sway in the Morning like a month ago and it was fire. So check out, let me, let me go ahead and put this in there and hail her up, Havaya Mighty. That's her real name too, she's from Brampton. 
And so uh, we need to support that, that type of work. Okay. While you're doing that, because I know you can multi-purpose. Bam. <laughs> Ken A has a question. How can we get rid of the white privilege we contribute to, to support it because it gives us power and authority? Our community cannot give because we are blacks. We, we use those positions against blacks around us to keep our privilege advantage. So I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know exactly what the question is. What I heard was um, that sometimes in our community, there is lateral violence where we use our positionality of power by proximity to whiteness against our own communities. And I would acknowledge that's actually a thing. That is definitely a thing. And I often talk about proximity to power as being detrimental to our community because it doesn't represent real power. Being close to power does not represent real power. And if we are in places that um, require us stepping on other people, and this is one of the, the crabs in the bucket scenarios that has been is age old since the Willie Lynch letters, where they will try to position us against ourselves, whether it's our social service agencies, whether it's, you know, you look at um, all the different cultural and, and, and ethnic groups, every island, every country has a cultural association. And I can promise you each one of them has reached out to me to try to get them funded. And it's sometime the case where, where we will intentionally or unintentionally use our positionality of power in proximity to power against our own community. That happens. And we need to be aware of that. We need to check in on that. And the lateral violence thing is actually real. And it's harmful. And it's a part of like intergenerational trauma. So I try to be trauma informed. And what that means, I had to learn this. I'm going to be 40. I, I'm working on my grades. I'm still learning. Um, you, don't sometimes, want, you, don't, you don't want to get to this though. Well, you know what? <laughs> You're looking good, Dr. Vibe. You got the vibe, man. You know, they say it don't crack, bro. You're looking real good. So, you know, like for me, um, when I say trauma informed is I recognize that sometimes when these aggressions come out from us, of us, towards us, that it's not a personal thing that I actually try not to take it personally. It's a very difficult thing to do, by the way, but I try not to take it personal because I know that we are in a crabs in the bucket scenario, particularly with our nonprofits who've been generationally underfunded. Okay, the th you were trying to remember the names of all the three groups, the intermediaries. They're Tropicana Community Services in Toronto, the Black Business Initiative out of Halifax, and Le Group 3737 out of Montreal. So thank you to Floyd Dean for providing that information. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to see. Okay. Uh, hmm. It's a long one, but I'm going to get to it. Uh, for, this is from Andrea Pierce. She's saying, our society normalized inequities, aka racism. For example, a recently published StatCan report states that the last three generations of Blacks as a community is doing worse off economically from that generation to now. That for Black men, the higher the educational level, the higher the employment, stating that in the survey, Blacks answered that they deal with racism every day and go on with their daily lives. Lots of other facts about the horribleness of our current situation. Guess what the title was? Canada's Black Population, Education, Labor, and Resilience. Because we are real resilient, according to them, and we can deal with it, after all, we face it every day and go on. Therefore, there's no need to do anything about it. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, my thoughts are a critique on neoliberalism. Um, that what we're seeing is the, the, the erosion of our you know, our social determinants, right? All the aspects, childcare, uh, housing, transit, all of these inequalities are compounded with a, with a market that has commodified every aspect of our living. So that as our uh, earning, um, our real earning potential has remained stagnant through suppressed wages, our purchasing power has been eroded through inflation and through the higher cost of living. So that we can't do it. Like my father, you know, my father was one of the very few black iron workers who became a teacher in this city, uh, which was a great paying job, obviously. Um, but I'm looking at this generation now, you know, he got a chance to retire with benefits and a pension. 
people are having to go out and work three jobs for what the previous generations used to be able to earn in one. That's a hyper precarity in the workforce. And that hyper precarity is not by accident. When I say neoliberalism, I mean both big L liberalism because the liberal party is a neoliberal party and capitalism. They're, 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 you know, they're inextricably linked. And why that's detrimental to us is because they have us simultaneously tr chasing this dream that quite frankly is not attainable collectively as a community. It's attainable for a few individuals. And that is the essence of liberalism. Liberalism will put the primacy of the individual over the community, which I think is actually counter or antithetical to our values as black peoples on these lands and, and around the world. That we are inherently a collectivist and, and so like, I'll say socialist, but there's a lot of different language we can use. You look at, you know, the, the, the radical um, uh, black leaders that, that, that were anti-imperialist in continental Africa and in the Caribbean, you know, there are, there's deep rooted socialist theory coming out of the, the, the Caribbean in the political parties. And so these are the effects you know, the, the cause is capitalism. The effects are that they have been able to keep our, our jobs and our wages stagnant while simultaneously driving the costs up on food, transportation, health care, child care, you know, uh, housing. So our purchasing power has been eroded. You couple that with our barriers to access to capital and you have a recipe, like it's no mistake that we're worse off now than we're, it's actually the formula, it's by design. They will redline entire communities where mainstream banks, they'll take your credit card, they'll take your banking fees, they'll take your mortgage, they'll take your student loan, but if you go and ask them for a business loan, do you know what they're gonna tell you? You're high risk, sorry. I had to do, like, you know, <laughs> I went through all this stuff and I had to remind banks that they didn't have the money to lend me in the beginning to begin with. Banks actually don't lend you money. You borrow money into creation. That's how capitalism works. It's called fractional reserve banking. So if a bank has $20, they lend out a hundred and then they collect interest on that extra $80. It is a Ponzi scheme and it is designed to keep people out of the economy. That's why Donald Trump can go bankrupt so many times and still have access to money. All right. Got two more questions for you, Matthew, because I know you've been giving it all. So got two more left for you. First of all, Robin has this statement and then I'll ask you a question. Black folks fight with other groups over government funds because we all bought into the corporate frame that the size of the funding pie is set in stone. However, increasing corporate taxes by just 2%, and closing corporate tax loopholes would increase the pie massively for all. Considering this, is this, time to, is this the time to make big asks that would fly? We campaigned on it. Shout out to Robin, man. You sound like a new Democrat. Um, we campaigned on a wealth tax. You say 2%, I agree. We came out with a piddly 1% wealth tax on the ultra wealthy, by the way. So here's another thing that I need to share with folks. And I, and I always take it upon myself to provide popular education. And I do that by saying things that might not be widely well known, but um, wealth is not earned by the wealthy. And when we hear about increased taxes, there's many in our community who mistakenly think that people who have billions of dollars have earned that money. They have not. Taxing the rich is not the same as taxing the working class. Your personal income tax is based on your hours times your wages, which is your income. And you have a marginal tax rate on that that is significant as working class professionals in this country. The ultra wealthy, however, they earn money on top of money, not on top of labor. So we're not talking about taxing their labor. We're talking about taxing their capital, which is a very different story. So when we talk about the ultra wealthy, this, this is the facts. 87 families in this country have more wealth than the lowest earning 12 million Canadians. Guess what those Canadians look like? And while those wages stay the same between uh, 2014, or sorry, between 2012 and 2016, on average, each of those 87 families accumulated $800 million per family on average almost a billion dollars over four years while we're struggling to pay off our student debts and pay off our mortgages and pay off our, our, all of our consumer debt. So what does that mean? 
Wealth tax means taxing the ultra wealthy. So when we talk about a 1% wealth tax on people who have wealth of more than $20 million, 20 million, then we, we know that we can bring into the economy uh, $7 billion a year over 10 years. We can have $70 billion into the federal uh, uh, coffers, you know, $7 billion. So what Robin suggested of 2% is easy math. If we lowered the threshold to 10 million, it's easy math that we can start to reclaim and recapture the distribution of wealth in this country. Who generates wealth in this country? It is not the wealthy. How do we know that? COVID taught us that. How did COVID tell us that? COVID taught us that because when workers were forced to stay home, the country came to its knees. If the wealthy, the CEO class and the corporate class of this country vacation for the next 10 months, we would never miss them in this economy. Working class people create wealth. So while you're paying 30, 45% marginal tax on your earned labor, what you are doing is subsidizing the ultra wealthy in this country. So when we talk about a wealth tax, by the way, Robin, you'll be happy to know, we ran as that as New Democrats. Uh, we ran on closing tax loopholes as New Democrats. Liberals have no interest in this work, by the way. Why? Because they're a corporatist party, that's why. My private member's bill, this is the scoop that you guys have. My private member's bill in the House of Commons is going to be on a super wealth tax. Because when we talk about democratizing the economy, we're talking about redistributing the wealth. And when capitalists talk about socialism and redistributing the wealth, when liberals talk about liberalism and trickle-down economics, there's no such thing as trickle-down economics. There's only been a siphoning of working class wealth to the wealthy in this country. We need to dismantle that. And we're gonna do that by taxing the shit out of all of them. We're coming for Google, I'm coming for uh, uh, Amazon, I'm coming for Apple, Facebook, all the digital folks. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna bring it all home. We're gonna bring it all home so that we can fund things like pharmacare and dental care and mental health and housing. You know, all those social determinants that keep black people in the situation we're in, we're gonna fund it on their backs, not ours. Okay, final question of the night, my man. Woo, you got me fired up. <laughs> Good stuff. You're fire, fire, man. A man is asking, of the money that has been approved for our community, is there funding available to for profit startup businesses, in particular for construction slash development? No. I don't believe that there is at the moment. As I said, the $25 million, I think as I were to understand it was to be distributed through the community um, as a form of like community supports. However, there is some incredibly phenomenal work on a concept called community benefits networks. Shout out to people in Toronto who are doing that, the Toronto Community Benefits Network, Rosemary Cowell, phenomenal, phenomenal leader in our community. Uh, shout out to her. And what that does is it says that when governments have big infrastructure projects, that there should be set asides, that, that again, that term again, for our community for things like procurement, which means direct monies that would flow to black owned businesses. They could be our restaurants for food. They could be our stores for goods. They could be our construction companies for subcontracting. That could be a thing. And so we need to have that in the framework. And I think like that is integral to, um, you know, to, 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 to black liberation theory. And um, I'm just, I have your asks here and I can't recall. So when you say add additional financial commitments to deal with other demands and operational capacity under the EDSC, for me, that's what I take from that ask in your work. So the 25 was a start. And as far as I'm concerned, 25, the $25 million is what we need to be clear about with government. That shit, sorry, that's not new money. That's old money. That's yesterday's announcement. They don't get to re-announce that money as being new money to solve this problem, eh? That's old money. So we're going to be very clear about that. We're going to be clear that when they want to re-announce the $25 million that's flowing, they will say, thank you for completing 2019's commitment. Now, again, being nonpartisan, 
I can share with you that Greg Fergus has always been very clear about ensuring that the government place and embed in its budgets um, equity, diversity, and inclusion frameworks that include what you've just put on the table. So, Dr. Vibe, you're on mute, my brother. All right. So what we're going to do, um, if you can answer this, well, and I know it's not a one-minute answer, but uh, Rich, Richard said, and not Richard, Robin says, can you share your deets on your bill? <laughs> the bill you're wanting to uh, put in the uh, wealth, wealth tax, but I don't think we have time to get into that. Right it hasn't now. been drafted. It's a private okay. member's bill. So what happened with COVID is that they weren't dealing with private member stuff. I know the intention of my motion or my bill, my private member's bill. Um, but we're working on that with some incredible people. Robin, if you want to be, if you want to see how that process goes, I'll invite you and anybody else to form an economic working group on that one topic. And you can, you can um, see how a private member's bill is drafted, crafted and presented. Okay. All right. Well, that is it. I would like to say a huge thank you to Mr. 15 interview yesterday and another long one today. I'm no. here. Hey, this has been like life for me, man. I, you know, <laughs> you guys have done more for me than I've done for you. You got me fired up. I'll be, um, you know, I'll be ready to take on the week when it comes to me next week. Well, before we close out, I want to have Richard Sharp come back in and give some final words. Thanks very much, uh, Matthew, for coming on the show and uh, responding to the call. Uh, to, to, to share your wisdom and your experience and uh, your, your level of activism in, in Parliament. Very much appreciated. I think we should, we should all take note uh, of you and, and what you're doing over there uh, in House of Commons at a, at a it's, it's Halifax in Hamilton, right? That's where you're, that's where you're The heart and soul of Hamilton Center. Heart and soul of Hamilton. All right, then. Just, just a couple of quick uh, points here for, for folks who don't know. So we've had this wonderful opportunity uh, to be part of the uh, alternative federal budget uh, to create a chapter for the UN decade for people of African descent. So that's the UN push initiative that we're uh, inviting other people to contribute to. My man, Robin Brown on the, on the line here is uh, helping to pen that. Uh, and we're going to be putting a draft out uh, for folks to take a look at uh, next week and, and in, in hopes that we can uh, 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 make sure that we have some voice in that budget alternative budget. It's, uh, I know the NDP is very um, familiar with it. It's coming out of the Center for Policy Alternatives. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that this time, uh, this challenging time, emotionally traumatic time uh, uh, of the protests, of the killings of our people has opened up this opportunity where PUSH is talking now to a number of uh, political parties uh, yesterday during the march, there was a, a, a session with uh, Sheer and his shadow cabinet. Uh, we're having conversations with uh, Matthew, who's been really open, and you know he shared he shared his motion with us right straight, right. Um, and then we're and, and Greg Ferguson and a number of members of Black Caucus are supporting. So we have a time where we're we we we're able to push and we're able to make some change, make some what I what I believe progress. I, I share uh, Matthew's uh, optimism about what's coming down the pike, but it does involve uh, community members to be part of that process and to have their voices lent uh, to this. It can't be a couple of us on the sideline. It can't be just Matthew. It can't be just Greg. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so, so I'd like to thank those who are continuing to work with us very quickly. Um, uh, um, Nadine Spencer with B BPA uh, for supporting all the back end, uh, the, the, the Zoom platform and our, and our web presence. Always a great thank you. Uh, Andrea Pierce, who's uh, my partner in crime of the UN Push Coalition doing the economic inclusion stuff. Uh, she, she gets to go and, and, and frighten the folks over in the house. Um, uh, Sharon, Sharon Fletcher, who's going to be amplifying and has been amplifying our, our video uh, online presence. Uh, we're planning on growing uh, uh, UN Push Coalition. It's, it's going to be bigger than what it was before uh, as a two-issue or three-issue organization. Folks are asking for something on a national level, and we're, we're going to see if we can do some strategic planning and, some, and some, some strategic thinking to morph ourselves into something that people can go to to, to help amplify these issues uh, on national scale. 
so uh, also next up uh, in terms of uh, we're working on a, a conversation online with Leslin Lewis, who's that black woman who was running for the, uh, the Conservative Party leadership. Um, a reminder that UN PUSH is, is, is totally nonpartisan and we're talking to everybody, anybody that might be able to amplify the work that we're doing. So thank you very much. And last but not least, Dr. Vibe, uh, you are the, the pillar of the community right now and the voice of the community. I uh, appreciate you uh, stepping up and always responding to the, the, the call to support uh, us when, when needed to amplify our messages and our voices. So again, thank you all again, Matthew and, and, and folks for, for joining us on a, on a beautiful uh, Saturday evening here uh, in, in Canada. Next Thanks. call I'm on, I'm committed to bringing Jigme with me. Okay. I, we All received right. that. We received that big time. Um, All right. Matthew, do you have any final words? I just want to say, um, you know, check in with, um, with yourself, take care of yourself, be kind to yourself, be gracious with yourself. Know that we're in traumatic times and, and whether you've been able to successfully compartmentalize it or whether this has been a catharsis for dealing with trauma that you just haven't dealt with, um, know that that's all okay and that we will continue to build power and that I believe we will win. If I could borrow from, from, um, from my dear sister, Sandy Hudson and Black Lives Matter, I believe we will win. Excellent. Thank you very much everyone for staying on for the call. This is definitely one of the best conversations we have had in regards to UND pad conversations. If you want to find out more, go to the UND pad website and check out and keep up. And if you are willing to help us out, we're small, but we're mighty, but we want to become big and mighty with the right people. I'm Dr. Vibe, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. You can touch base with me via my website, the drvibeshow.com. And one last thing I will share with everybody, you, you may or may not know the name Robert F. Smith. He is one of the wealthiest men, black men in America. And if you don't know who he is, he is the gentleman that paid off the remaining tuition for all the Morehouse graduates in the last year. And he was interviewed recently and um, they asked him, what words of advice do you have for the black community? He said, don't waste this crisis. On that note, everybody, God bless, peace be well, keep the faith and walk good. Good night, everybody.